I think one of the first things we need to do is kind of explain like where we are geographically to kind of understand the uh, well to understand the ecosystem around us. So we are in the floodplain of the Colorado River, which means it's a alluvial uh, river floodplain soil. Uh, Central Texas, and I guess we're we're not necessarily a whole lot of, of them on this property, but it's basically post oak hackberry elm uh, savanna style. Uh, ecosystem that we're surrounded by so a lot of the trees that I just mentioned we have surrounding us you know uh, another one we have is and what I'm going to just do is identify some of the trees within sight so we got a gum tree which is a, a you know it's a bird bird uh, berry provider big time um, good strong wood is that too. the bromelia gum bromelia and is post oak a tree or are you saying post oak as an after oak like Post it's... oak is a type of oak tree, okay. and it's the, the dominant oak tree here. Um, mm. Yeah, so it's a dominant hardwood. Okay. That's in... What about 8 million different species of oak? Yeah, yeah, and so you, in this area you'll find you'll find Schumark red oaks, and you'll find the Texas red oak, and you'll find um, live oaks occasionally. Okay. Um, but yeah, post oaks is mainly what you see when you're driving down 969 and you see the big oak tree. Mm. But yeah, so the next one we have is a Fruit producing native that we have is the persimmon. Persimmon is a dioecious tree, so there's male and female. You'll see their black, their green fruit turning into to black right as we go into uh, to to fall. And you'll see it in raccoon poop everywhere, and you'll see it all over the place. So it's a it's a big uh, it's a big wildlife food provider, totally edible to people too. Um, the the Texas persimmon you can use as an indicator most of the time to, to let you know whether or not uh, your land is good for the for the per persimmons in general. So if you have a band of clay that's dense in persimmons, you could, or the Texas persimmons, you could probably grow the Asian or Eastern persimmons in it. Um, some of the other, and what's really left on the hillside is just is just persimmon and hackberry. And so hackberry is what y'all are standing underneath right here. Uh, it's a short lived tree, 60 to 80 years, and then it, it it usually falls to a root disease called charcoal root rot. So it is definitely a, a native um, pioneer tree. You know, they're, the, they're weedy. They pop up all over the place. The birds carry them. They'll bring them to you for free. There's never any reason to plant them. But, uh, you know, if you're if you're trying to revegetate an area, it's a good canopy tree to, to lean on first. It grows really fast. And, you know, the birds will eat it all up. Uh, goats graze it too, right? Uh, so it's a good, it's a good free easy one. Um, some of the other trees that I noticed up the hill is there's a there's soap berries on the top of the hill, which is is a nice useful plant. Um, as its name indicates, you can use it to make soap. Um, American elm or cedar elm. Cedar elm. Cedar elm would be the next one. And where's the closest one? A lot of the trees up that, were, that way. A lot of the trees that we cut down. Um, or that were dead up here were cedar elms. There you go. There's the cedar elms up at the top right there that's already losing its leaf. Yeah. It's already yellowing out up there. And it's a first reason. And uh, Bill Mollison recommended it as a leaf litter tree, something that you would want to, you could encourage to grow on the north side of your swales um, to drop leaf litter into your swales because the leaf litter decomposes really quickly and they're a, a mineral accumulator, like most of the, the, the quick growing uh, native trees are. Um, so that's what we have going on out there. One of the other things I wanted to do is kind of walk out into this fallow area of the garden and kind of show some of the families of plants that are coming up here naturally. And I think there's a, there's a lot to be said for being able to recognize the weeds that are growing on your property to be able to figure out what annuals grow well or what perennials are going to grow well. So, right here, these guys are, uh, they're, uh, they're, you know, the common name for them can be white weed. But it's a solanaceous. You can see the little fruit even looks like a little tomato. Some of them will look like little eggplants. Mm -hmm. But you can use this guy as an indicator that peppers will probably grow well in the soil. The tomatoes will probably grow well in the soil. Eggplants will probably grow well in the soil. And as you go out into the field, there's, as far as other families, anywhere you find grasses, you can find a bunch of grasses. Guys right here are the native buffalo gourd. 
Um, this is a cucurbit family. So if you find these guys out here, you know, melons and pumpkins will likely be a crop that you can grow. Um, and you know, if you come out here, you, you notice there aren't any thistles. So artichokes probably aren't going to be the, your best choice out here. Um, there's, there's not any, it doesn't look like there's a lot of native annual legumes either. So I would imagine bees and pe uh, beans and peas are a little bit harder to grow here. Uh, but yeah, I think that that is a valuable tool to start learning your, your plant ID so you can come out into fields or in clients locations or on farms or whatever and look around and see what wants to be there already. So, you know, I would say, you know, fine weed, if you see a lot of morning glory, sweet potatoes might be something that is going to do well out there because a lot of these families, not only are their blooms similar, their requirements in the soil are, can be similar also. So that's one thing to observe. Um, this little guy right here, it's yeah, a, what is it? It smells so good. Uh, it's a euphorb, um, spurge is what people call it. And there's lots of different types of spurges. This is something you see people pulling all the time. I think it's like the, the least harmful of weeds you can have in the garden. And it's also a phosphorus accumulator. So leaving this in, in place as a ground cover, it gets to where it starts being cold and then it drops all of its leaf litter right underneath it and it's it's packed in phosphorus. So, what did you call so it? this is it's a spurge. spurge. Uh, another common name is croton. Croton, yeah. And uh, prairie tea. Prairie oh. tea. You can make a tea from the leaves. It's a very common relaxing. Yeah. Oh, cool. yeah. Alright, so those are the annuals I noticed out here. Plant ID, very important. So pick up on that stuff. Um what's this guy right here? <laughs> Excuse me. That's it. That's it. I see stinging nettle too. Yeah, this is a mallow. Yeah. This is a mallow, so you know there's some of the some of our useful plants that are in the mallow family are uh okra and the uh, and the hibiscus. So this is just Indian mallow. It's got really pretty orange to yellowish leaves. So okra does really well here. Yeah, so there you go, there's a mallow. Okra does really well in Texas, so I yeah. think you just gotta plant it here. Yeah. But so so there's pretty limited diversity in this field right now. Of course, it's the end of the summer, but mm -hmm. um, like I said, you can come out and see in, in any field you go into before you till it, you can see what wants to grow there just by learning your families and fruit shapes and plant identification. So basically, gang, That's a square one. in the permaculture garden, we're supposed to have about two thirds, hey Jewel, hey. about two thirds cultivar. Well, for every three cultivars, you're supposed to have one farmer's tree. And a farmer's tree is a native leguminous nitrogen fixing tree. It's deep rooted. It's got a sugary bean pod. It fixes nitrogen. It's got light shade. It's a pioneering plant. It grows up, stabilizes the region around it. And then as your fruit trees come up, you can start pruning back your farmer's trees. And so on the berm, that's the primary spot. That's where the cultivars are gonna go. Then we're gonna put the farmer's trees uphill above the swale. And so we'll have one line of drip irrigation running down the length of the berm and then we'll tee off to the farmer's trees. And so not every plant in this garden is about what's for us. It's about what's for sustaining the ecosystem around it. Okay, now Zach's going to do I'll a little... i dig the hole while you talk. About. Okay. Uh, and so some of the trees that we've got, and we've got to get a few more. We've got a couple of pomegranates yeah. down there, a kefir pear, a couple of loquats. We've got over here, we've got mulberry yonder. Uh, we've fig. got a couple of Celeste fig that are going in the shade. We need to get a couple of Santa Rosa and Methylene plums. And I wanted us to get a couple of Asian persimmons. So now that's four trees. So when we're setting out our cages and spacing these plants, we need to leave at least four, if not five holes, because we've only got one pair. So we might want to get another pair, two Asian persimmons and two Plums. The pears need it. They need a buddy to, to pollinate. I don't think don't they, they need it as much as the plums, but I got yeah, a pair, I got a pair always... recently. They came and they saw, they said okay. the wild went along with it. So. A lot of plants so. need to cross pollinate <laughs> with other, like you your pear well, needs like another pear alongside it, or the plum needs it's another it's plum alongside of it. Lovely. And uh, so what we're going to do next is we're going to plant the trees, and then at the bottom of each tree we have a fungal mycorrhizal <laughs> inoculant. So we want about a quarter of a cup of this stuff at the bottom of each tree, touching the roots if we can. And then we'll broadcast a little bit on the surface to inoculate the surface of the ground. But we've also got soft rock phosphate, green sand that has potassium and magnesium in it. We've got agricultural lime. Where's that at? 
and we've got dispersal. Uh, the mycorrhizae, Taylor, it's over there, or Zach, it's, it's the far left in the back of the car there. And then we've got some organic fertilizer too. Um, so then we'll, we'll plant the trees, we'll get the mycorrhizal inoculant in the bottom of the trees, then we'll make, make a mix of the soft rock minerals, the rest of the mycorrhizal inoculant. We'll broadcast that out everywhere if we can. I, we can use it all up or not. Like we don't need to use up all the sulfur. I got a big old heavy bag of sulfur. Ag lime can go out. It usually recommends 2,000 pounds per acre. Whereas the soft rock phosphate's like six or eight hundred pounds per acre, so you can put all the lime out you want. And you're not going to make the soil more basic. You can try, but you won't. Not with one bag of lime, which is what the uh, agricultural lime is actually calcium. Then we're going to put the cover crops out. So trees, soft rock minerals, and for cover crops, we've got clover, we've got ryegrass, which is already out on the hillside now. We've got plants from the Apiaceae family, which is dill, parsley, and cilantro. We've got plants from the Brassicaceae family, which is radish, turnip, and mustard. And then we've got Austrian winter pea, and that's in the Leguminaceae family. That's what the pea family is, is the legumes. Okay, I think Zach's ready. Okay, so planting in a berm is a little bit different than planting trees in, in native untilled soil. So normally whenever you plant a tree in the ground, if it's a of decent size, you'd want to dig out a big hole, loosen the soil a minute, backfill it. This stuff's already loosened, thank, you know, thanks to all you guys digging the swale. So I literally would just dig the size of the, of the pot that needs to go into the ground. You can use the pot you're going to plant to make sure that you're getting it at the right height um that your hole is wide enough once you got that going on we're gonna put we're just gonna put this in because the, the soft rock, rock minerals are that's all on top. and it's gonna be top dressed that's so, the only thing that needs to go in the hole yeah so this stuff right here is it's a organic fertilizer that's been inoculated with mycorrhizal fungi mycorrhizal fungi is a fungi that will it does a sim, symbiotic connection to the tree relationship with the tree get available from the soil so if there's unavailable phosphorus specifically mycorrhizal fungi will create this this specific relationship with this tree and so this that stuff's in here dry and dormant and ready to ready to be exposed to root um so what you what you want is root contact and so on a fresh transplanted tree you're just going to dust the bottom and the sides of the hole dust the bottom and then i dust the sides and a lot of times you'd want to break up that root ball but these look really nice in their pots there's no there was no circling roots you know it was just they're just barely rooted to the outside so i'm not going to disturb it at all um you can apply you can top dress with this stuff to existing trees you just want to kind of rake back the mulch that's there or whatever try to expose it to the bare soil and then cover it back up with mulch or with fresh mulch or with compost to encourage the uh, roots to come up to it so that's in it's been dusted and then you want this this grade either slightly below so we're talking a half inch or so to make a little pool around it or level with the grade you do not want it above the grade and you do not want it too low in the grade that really depends on the species you're growing on how affected they'll be by it low clots can be grown from stem cuttings so as long as you're within a reasonable range it's going to root out anyways from whatever point it makes soil contact with so kind of loosen it a little bit and then just backfill around and one thing I like to do is just build a little tiny berm circle around the outside. Just kind of pat the clay. And that'll encourage water to sink down around the root ball rather than run off the top of the berm. And just enough to capture an inch or two of water. And then, do we have mulch too, Kirby Fry? Mm -hmm. Green manure. Yep. Oh, I see, okay. We've got coarse mulch over there. So, so at, the, really at the base of each one, we can use the coarse mulch for okay. this stuff, man. Okay. So I guess we'll uh, we'll do after we spread the cover crops and before we put on the cages and run the irrigation, we can uh, take a wheelbarrow of, of that coarse mulch and put it around the base of each tree. But yeah, that's it. And you just kind of want to tamp it so it doesn't wash out when you go to water. That's it. And then soak her in. Yeah. 